Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to SOAS. Um, for those of you who don't, haven't been here before or are not used to coming to SOAS and sitting in lectures in this lecture theatre, you're very welcome. Um, my name is Casper Melville. I am a senior lecturer in the School of Arts, and perhaps more pertinently, I'm the director of the Festival of Ideas this year, of which this is one of the events. In fact, the second event, we had a launch on Saturday night in the lecture theatre on the other side of the... Uh, uh, over there with uh, Steam Down playing with some of our SOAS students. Uh, the theme of the festival this year is thinking through music. So there is a music theme running through throughout all our events. Uh, after this one, there's going to be 10 more events. Uh, if you can pick up a booklet like that, that will tell you what events we've got. We've got panels on dance. We've got a DJ summit. We've got a variety of parties. We're having a, an old school reggae sound system coming into this room. The seats where you're sitting retract hopefully not while you're sitting in them, and go back <laughs> against the wall, and there'll be a lovely reggae sound system in here. So um, uh, there aren't that many of these left, actually, but if you can find one, please do, or you can just uh, search on Eventbrite, and all the events are on there. So uh, a bit of housekeeping. We, um, if there's a fire alarm, there is a fire exit just there. Um, we're hoping that's not going to happen, or we can go out the front doors out there. Uh, there are toilets um, just to the left of the main lobby. The ladies' toilet is on the ground floor and the men's on the floor above. Um, there's some people here who are filming and recording for the festival, but we would prefer if you didn't uh, use your phone to record, Nikki, um, and please turn your mobile phones off. And just so you know, we've got a couple of our very talented students here who are contributing to this, this event uh, creatively. So we have Hannah Wingard over here, who is painting, who's going to do a live painting. And we've got Tuarora Keitahi sitting up there who is going to write a poem inspired by Nikki and by what's happening here. Um, so that's what we've, we've tried to do with the festival is involve a lot of students and, get, and, and document what's happening here so, uh, creatively so that we can produce materials that we can use later on in our, you know, presenting what the kind of work we do and trying to encourage more students to come. Um, so to tonight's event. Um, Nikki Yo is, a, is, is one of the most highly regarded pianists in, in UK jazz, pianists, composers, teachers. Uh, she's worked with many of the top uh, UK jazz musicians, people like Steve Williamson and Jason Yard and uh, Cleveland Watkiss. In fact, she made a brilliant album, of, a duet album with Cleveland Watkiss, the singer. Um, but she's also played with uh, Nana Cherry and with, uh, with The Roots, the, U the US hip hop band The Roots, which she was a member of for a while. We're going to find out more about that a little, in a little bit. Um, among the many awards that she's won, she's been the independent, uh, she won the Independent Award for Best Jazz Musician of the Year in 1996. And she was the Jazz FM Instrumentalist of the Year in 2017, which gives you a sense of how long she's been doing this at a very, very high standard. Uh, I just want to read a few words from the jazz journalist Kevin Legendre. Um, writing in 2016. Those who have seen Nikki, he, he says yo, but I'm saying Nikki, those who have seen Nikki will testify to her virtuosity on the keyboard, drawing on pioneers from the world of jazz, classical music, and soul, above all the likes of Herbie Hancock, Alexander Scriabin, and Stevie Wonder, yo has developed a style that can move from explosive rhythmic energy to understated lyricism at a moment's notice. Indeed, her ability to conjure up the most vividly evocative of moods by way of subtle, probing harmony has been proven time and again. I'm really excited. When I put this uh, festival together, it was one of the first things I thought, I really want to get uh, Nikki to come in, I really want to talk to her, and I really want to talk to her when she's sitting at a piano. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nikki O. And what a fantastic sparkly outfit, Nikki. Thanks, thanks, Casper. Um, I wanted to match the brilliant SOAS logo that you guys have It was come all up with. <laughs> brilliantly planned. Um, welcome to SOAS. I'm so happy that you're here. This all kind of started for me. We met here, didn't we, about, we I don't did. know, six or seven years ago. We had a panel for the students, which is about careers, I think, in the music industry, something like that. And you yeah. kindly came in to kind of uh, contribute to that. And I just, the thing that really struck me, in addition to the fact that you were really nice, was that you said, 
oh, I grew up around the corner. Mm. And it's not often that you meet people who've grown up around the corner. I mean, Sayers is full of people from all around the world, but actually even not many people live in this area. A lot of people who, you know, the English people who teach at Soaz often aren't from London. So tell me a bit about how it was. Where, where did you grow up? Where, where, what, what was it like where you grew up? Well, I come from a generation, um, sorry, I come from a, a line, a lineage of people that have grown up in this area. So I'm mixed, my British side, um, my mother, she grew up in Holborn and her father grew up in Holborn on Theobald's Road and his dad did. So I, I, th I figure we've all played at Coram's Fields when we were kids. <laughs> my son did too. So uh, when I say that to people, they're like, oh my gosh, that's so central, central London. But it wasn't always sort of really like nice Expensive. around here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was all, it was, it was a bit run down and wasn't like it is now. But, uh, yeah. but there were some parts, it's like London has always been, there's always like highs and lows of different areas. But yeah, so I feel like I'm really connected to this area on 50% of my DNA. <laughs> so um, you're not, it doesn't make you quite a Cockney living around here, but it is, there is... No, I'm, a, I'm an actual official Cockney. You because are, because I, Yeah, I was born in Bart's Hospital, yeah. Oh, right, so it's the, the sound of Bow Bells, Bells. Right. right. Yeah. And there's a, tra <laughs> there's a trace of that in, in how you speak, which is, you know... Not half, yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> which, again, is something, you know, relatively unusual, and we'll talk mm. about this in the world of jazz or in the world of, you know, academia, in fact. You know, yeah. it's one I of could the, be a bit posh when I'm ready. That's what <laughs> I need to be. But <laughs> Code switching. Yeah, well, right? you have to, right? So or tell do you. That's a bigger conversation. But tell me about... Tell me about music in your young life. Like, mm. when did you when did it start to emerge as something that was interesting to you? What kind of music was around in your in your household? So I grew up in St John Street in a block of flats um, above a library, and um, yeah, I grew up with my grandparents and my mum, and they would listen to all of the hits back in the day from um, what's the what's the guy's name, Maxi Bygraves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those kind of hits those kind of hits and then my mum was really into Ravi Shankar she was also really into uh, the Stones and she loved um, reggae so she listened to loads of reggae so a lot of her friends were from the Caribbean so I grew up around that culture too so that was my sort of like early sound world and then tunes from television because in the 70s and the 80s everyone had the TV on all the time right that was the main thing so music from adverts um, when I was really small, my mum, my, my godmother bought me this little tiny xylophone, so I'd always, that was my favourite toy, mm -hmm. and a record player, so I always wanted to hear music. But when I was three years old, my grandmother bought me a piano, which was from a second-hand shop, so an antique, but probably was just a cheap second-hand piano. But like a, a big proper no, piano, a toy pi a little toy tiny, piano. like a... Like peanuts, like Schroeder's. Yeah, that like you know, the, you know the small, like tiny, tiny pianos. And so I'd pick out tunes that I would hear on the TV, like little riffs. And they, they were like, oh, you know, maybe she has an ear for music. So there was about five years old, and I had my first piano lesson. Mm -hmm. And my mum bought me a Bon Tempe keyboard that we kept in the hallway. And then uh, a few years fast forward until I was about seven, my granddad, who was a, a black cab driver. He put in extra shifts every night to pay off a loan that he'd got. He got a loan to buy me a piano, which I still have. It's, a, it's an upright piano. It's a very bad piano. It doesn't sound good now. And he took out a loan for £300, which was a lot of money in the 70s. So that, and that got me really into playing. So they'd so already identified at this point that music was going to be your thing. 100%. Yeah. Did you go out and play in the streets and were you, you know, be, do that as well? Were you yeah. also part of the community of Absolutely. Like, running wild on the streets? Because, yeah. I mean, 1980s, 70s and 80s in London, it was quite, mm. it was quite rough in certain ways, wasn't it? It was yeah. quite difficult. It was quite difficult. It was, it was rough, but it was also quite like, like a village as well. So, you know, everybody looked out for each other. It wasn't sort of, you know, now people won't really let their kids out on the street. I'm sure some of you guys have experienced the UK around that time. And, you know, you could pretty much go out even as a seven-year-old and hang out with your mates, mm -hmm. and it was pretty safe, yeah. So, when, at which point, so you've got your piano, mm -hmm. and I think when we were talking earlier, ahead of this, you were, you were already kind of making things up yourself as well as learning at yeah. the same time. Tell, mm -hmm. tell us about that. Why, what gave you the impetus to be composing when you were young? Just, it, was just, it was just kind of a, an inner, inner urge, you know? I know Joe Henderson's wrote a jazz great tune called song. Inner Urge. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great song. Uh, you know. That one there. 
there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, it's yeah. I don't know. It was just an inner. It was a compulsion almost. You know, I, I thought I'm I'm reading. I'm learning to play. I was having some elementary jazz, um, not jazz, elementary piano lessons, and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll give that a go. You know, so with the very limited knowledge I had, I think I wrote a piece that was pretty much limited to like minims and crotchets. <laughs> it was the called The stuff. Dragons Are In The Dark. Oh, I'm not going to play that tune. Sorry, it was All called right. what? No, let's hear the, the name. The Dragons Are In The Dark. Oh my goodness, it's yeah. quite dark. And <laughs> yeah, and my mum threw it away by accident, which is a shame. I would like to have kept it, but I did write Don't it Don't you still out. remember it, though? Yeah, I do, I'm not going to play it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's like, we'll yeah. have time for requests at the end, so <laughs> just so, so you know. No, it's, it's, maybe, maybe I'll do a remix of it at some point. But um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I, it was interesting because at that point I thought in order to be able to capture my ideas, I have to write them down. And because th I was limited in what I knew, of the, uh, I was limited on, on the, which notes I knew on uh, how to read, you know, and, and rhythms and all of that, I pretty much limited it to what I could replicate, you know. So, uh, you know, I, I, even if I'd heard stuff that was like 16th after the beat, I wouldn't have understood how to write that down when I was five. But how did you know, you know about even about minims and crotchets and that kind of stuff. Beginner's Who piano books. I, I had a couple of lessons, um, sporadic lessons here and there, until I found a, the teacher that I liked for a little bit. So a couple of piano lessons, and they would come to the house and, and all of that. But you made the point just now where you kind of said, not jazz, as if your yeah. entry into music wasn't specifically via jazz, it was just by you playing. At what point did you become aware that there was a thing called jazz or yeah. a, a world out there? I kind of, um, I feel like I've got my back towards certain people. Is it all right? I just feel like there's a whole, yeah, I don't want to, yeah, is, it, is that better? Yeah, right. <laughs> We're kind of trying to get everybody, we huddle around and be in the same area. They could just be like, and, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm a people person, so mm. I'm, yeah, I can't just pretend people are not here. Um, for, well, uh, attracted to jazz, I heard the word jazz in my head. It was like a, like a calling, you know, and I didn't know what it was because I didn't grow up around listening to jazz. So I would ask, um, around like my nan my grandmother my nan she used to be really sweet woman and she used to do lots of uh, shopping for some of the neighbors that were disabled so there's one lady who just really couldn't get out my nan would just do that as a, as a nice thing to do she didn't publicize it she would do that but this woman was a piano player and a very good piano player and she had this little contraption that had been built for her to be able to reach the pedals and so she was like an access that i had to this world of a professional musician because she would actually go out be taken out in, a, in, the, in this van and go and do gigs and then brought back and be in her house. So that was her, her escape into the world. And she'd earn a bit of money from it as well. Um, and so I said to her, you know, I, I've, I can hear this word jazz in my head. Can you show me what that is? And she's like, no, I can't. I don't, I don't know how to play jazz. But I have a copy of Jungle Book Bare Necessities. And <laughs> which One is kind of jazzy, right? Jazz tunes <laughs> it's, yeah. So um, I start, read that and then I saw these chords and I was like, what is that? Try to work them out to my best knowledge. I'm like, what's that seven on that chord symbol? What does that mean? I need to find that. I need to find the answers to that. Um, and then it just kind of evolved that when I was in secondary school, there was Don Rendell who was teaching at my school. Okay, so hang on, that's weird. Or well, not weird, but that's quite surprising. Don Rendell, mm. if you don't know, is a very well-known Great tennis sax player. Yeah. Um, an unusual man in many ways. Mm -hmm. We might get onto that in a minute. But yeah. what's he, why is he teaching in your school? I mean, surely he's touring the world with, with jazz bands at this point, isn't he? Well, I think it's like any, any musician, you end up being a chameleon. You have to do, you do a bit of teaching, a bit of writing, and all of the things that kind of interest you within the realms of musical, um, musical life. So he was teaching there as a, as a job. You know, Perry, so Perry, Perry, Perry teacher, saxophone teacher. So I study in saxophone with him. Ah. Yeah, yeah, I don't play saxophone anymore, which is a shame. I wish I could, but I probably wasn't been, have been very good. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, my, wasn't really my natural voice. But clearly at that point, were you, you probably weren't aware that he was a famous jazz musician then. You just thought Not he was really, a teacher yeah. at school, right? Yeah, I mean, he would talk about he was doing gigs and stuff like that, but I hadn't really got a concept of what that was. But I knew I had this calling and I was like, tell me about jazz what it what, what is it so he'd say to me oh look go and listen to Coltrane listen to Sonny Rollins listen to Herbie if you listen to all of Miles's albums you're pretty much going to hear any significant piano player for the last 50 years so we're talking about from the 80s that would have been going back to 1920s right mm -hmm. so um he'd send me these little give me these little lists and send me off and so I'd go to the record library which was underneath 
um, the flats where I grew up, you know, the Islington this is a libraries. section of the library, which, of the library where you can borrow records. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. it was like 10p. Take them home, tape them. Take them home and legally tape them. Yeah, yeah. of course, <laughs> home taking is killing music, it used yeah, to say yeah. on the yeah. inner sleeve. Do you remember well, that? Well, yeah, <laughs> pre Spotify killing music, but let's not go there. No. And so, um, yeah, then um, I, I taped stuff. And so I remember one time I listened, I taped Phil Collins on one side of um, a tape, right? Because I really loved Phil Collins and I taped Africa Brass on the opposite side. That's quite a combination, an unusual combination, which kind of is you, isn't it? Because there's always mm. a pop element, or you're quite happy to associate yourself with pop music as well as jazz, aren't you? In terms to, to, I mean, record labels gave, um, record companies gave music different genres. It's all, it's all an energy, you know. I mean, jazz, if you say jazz, it's such a broad thing. How can you listen to a weather report tune and listen to Art Tatum and say it's the same thing? You know, it's, it's a diff completely different voice, a different musical expression, different rhythm. So, so, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm very open to all of that. And I love it all. If it's good, it's good. Did you, did you find yourself copy, get, copying the solos? Like, well, the, the, the thing with a tape is I would listen to that on the way to school. So I'd listen to Phil Collins on the way to school and loving it because it was just really exciting and, and contemporary at the time. And in order to listen to Phil Collins again, I had to endure Africa Brass because it's very expensive to rewind your cassette. So you, with a pencil sometimes. You yeah, can but sometimes you can break. Time. It takes a long time. <laughs> that, you know. And so um, I'd have to listen to Africa Brass. And then at one point there became a switch where I was craving to listen to Coltrane and it's like the familiarity of of the obscure obscure sounds they became familiar to me and I started to be more interested in all of the other things that were surrounding that sound world so I'd then listen to the drums and listen to the brass arrangements in the background listen to Coltrane solo and it became really interesting it's not like I fell out of love with Phil Collins but I decided to uh, embrace Coltrane more so, there was know. just more of it, more of it there. So this, again, this is just a very direct relationship between you and the music. It's not being done via, you're not going to jazz clubs at this point, or you're not seeing a lot of jazz on TV, or mm. real, or even, I suppose you see the record label, uh, the record covers, right? So that mm. gives you some sense that, yeah. were you aware that this was the music of Af Afro-Americans primarily? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, a, a mate of mine, his mum worked at Ronnie Scott's, and she was a waitress. She was an art teacher in Highbury Grove, and she was also a waitress in Ronnie Scott's, and she got us into the club. So I think my first jazz gig I went to, I was 14, and I saw Steve Williamson was supporting Iraquere, the great Cuban band. So that, and that I was like, yeah, this is where I want to be. So I sort of, um, 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 I was surrounded by it, by almost just by it being my journey. Things just came in the way, like into, fell into, the, into my path, you know? Mm this jazz world just opened up to me. Is there something that you could play us that kind of captures that moment or, or you know, that sort of, that falling in love with that kind of thing? Yeah, I think I'm gonna play a piece that I wrote. Um, that I just feel like playing, it's not even to answer the question. It's called, it the, it's, it's it called the Healer and I wrote this for um, Shubha Mudgal. We did a great tour, Shubha Mudgal, fantastic Indian vocalist of North uh, Indian classical tradition. And we did a tour in uh, the year 99, I think it was, or 2000. And I wrote this piece for her, The Healer.
Beautiful. Thank you. What a tune. Thank you, Nikki. Wow. I feel a bit choked up, I must say. Um, sitting so close, it's so powerful. Um, Bless. Tell me about... Yeah, back to your story then. So we've got you as a teenager. We've got you with Don Rendell at school, mm -hmm. um, teaching you saxophone, and you starting to get inklings about jazz. And then, this is such an interesting part of your story, um, it kind of connects with my interests in so many ways because the person that you then found in your life was Ian Carr, yeah. or, um, who is a great, um, you know, a, m for me, I love him both because he's a brilliant trumpet player and Miles Davis is his idol and yeah. he's my favourite, but he's also a writer mm -hmm. and a teacher and he wrote a great book about Miles Davis. BBC and a really presenter. Yeah. So tell me, so you found yourself in one of these very interesting institutions, which is this kind of somewhere, not a formal school, mm. not a music college or anything like that, but something in between. Mm. Tell us about it. Yeah, it was a really interesting place, the Weekend Arts College in Kentish Town. I mean, um, it's, it still exists, the Weekend Arts College, but it's run by different people now, and it's a completely different thing. Um, at the time, there weren't really many places to study jazz in, like, informally as well, and there weren't many many workshops going on, especially ones that were as open-minded as Ian's. So Ian really encouraged everybody to compose, he encouraged everybody to listen to stuff that wasn't, um, you know, just coming from the, the, the great, great American songbook. So we'd learn like Eberhard Weber tunes and we'd, we'd learn like um, Ian's tunes and we could bring our own music in and uh, it was just very open-minded. So it was, it was a place for jazz and um, that dance and theater and uh, lots of the people that went to that particular arts place in was a weekend in, in Kentish Town ended up being professional in all of the fields that they went to so like you know Danny Sapani is an amazing actor who was in Black Panther um, I think uh, Che Walker he's an amazing actor and he trained up Michaela Cole and um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge so from all the drama side of things and Julian Joseph used to go there um, uh, Courtney Pine, uh, Michael Michael Mondesi, and so uh, Jason Robello. So, like you know, anybody that kind of went to WAC ended up, op you know, creating a career for themselves in their in their own voice. And was it specifically designed for people who might otherwise not have had a access to that kind of education? I mean, many of the people you just mentioned are young black, you know, yeah. Londoners who might not have found themselves at the Guildhall, or was it specifically? aimed at that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, as a kid, you're less aware of all of the kind of um, uh, reasons for places um, being in existence. You just think, oh, that's handy. I can go to that. And it feels like a great place to be. But actually thinking back, yeah, I definitely think they were ahead of their time. And the woman who started up, Celia Greenwood, she's definitely is very conscious and um, questions everything from her own unconscious bias to everybody else's and makes it, it, uh, any, any environment super inclusive. So I really feel that that, was, that, that definitely was the energy and yeah. the catalyst for her starting up that place, yeah. And, um, and tell, tell us a bit about, I mean, a, a, a contemporary, perhaps, you know, something that came afterwards but was inspired has been Tomorrow's Warriors and that kind of programme. Yeah. And talking to the people who've been through that programme, on the one hand, there's a great openness, mm. and on the other hand, there's quite a lot of rigour about it. Tell us about that. I mean, you're, anyone can go, but you don't necessarily stick around, right? Do they, they have high expectations of you? They, you know, what, what was it like to, you know, as a kind of mm. kid, to come into that environment with someone like Ian Carr? What was he like as a teacher? Ian was, I mean, Ian used to, he's, he's old school. He grew up, he was born in Scotland, he grew up, I think he grew up in Newcastle, correct me if I'm wrong, is that right, Jeremy? University, University in mm. Newcastle, thank you for that. And, um, so uh, he went to the army, he was, he was army trained, so he's kind of old school. So when you went to Ian's class, it was terrifying, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was, there was different levels. There were, he taught, taught the advanced, and I think there was an intermediate group, and then there was someone else who took the beginners. Um, but to get to the advanced group, you had to be really good. And he had this other thing called the London Fusion Orchestra that they were the ones who went out and did the gig. So everybody wanted to get into their London Fusion Orchestra. And so it was good because you could see a progression route and there was a healthy competition. But it was also quite difficult for me as a young woman because it was all boys. And it was very much they didn't really want a girl to come and join in. Mm. And how did that actually manifest? Were they mean to you or they didn't 
you know, how, <laughs> how did you, fi how did you find yeah. space within that world? It was weird, because I, when I went to school in Islin, and I went to Island Green, it was super rough, mm. and I ended up hanging out with the boys, just because the girls in that particular school were just really not very, they were quite, I don't want to use a bad word, but it's spiteful, put it that way. And I love, I love I'm, I've got loads of women friends, I'm not anti-woman, do you know what I mean? But those, <laughs> those yeah, at all, right? <laughs> but um, they, were, they were just like, you know, if you weren't into kind of like, um, hair and makeup, which I clearly am, clearly am now, but like, <laughs> if you, were, you know, but if you weren't into that, it weren't into that sort of like only thing you was into, if you were into playing the piano or saxophone or a bit of jazz, me, th then it's like you were not included in that set of people. So I hung out with the boys. So I thought going to Weekend Arts College would be okay because I'm used to hanging out with the boys, but it was very much like they'd have a really good piano player before I got the chair mm. and then he left. And they were a bit like, oh no, it's 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 a girl, you know. They didn't really, yeah, they didn't really want me there, and they made it really, really obvious. And Ian wasn't like, you know, saying, come on, embrace the embrace the girl. She's just one of she's one of us. She's a musician. No. It was like, well, you've got to, you've got to prove it to us as well. He was just as bad, really, you know. <laughs> so yeah, it Did was you, terrifying. That does sound terrifying. Was that? Helpful in some ways? Did it make you have to up your game? Did you have to work really hard? In I order think to so. In, I think in so. In one of the interviews yeah. that I read, that you you, you mentioned uh, something that he'd said to you, where he'd come over to you and sort of said, "You don't know what you're doing, Nikki." Yeah. Or worse to that affair. You got to and do it with the voice, you know. And he then was you <laughs> said, "Well, I went home and made sure that I knew for next week." So it absolutely, did. yeah. He come up. He come up. I was playing, and I, I didn't know what I was doing because also he wasn't very clear. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say to me like these are the chords you need to play he didn't study we didn't study harmony with Ian mm. he expected you to go and do that on your own with your teacher we studied musicians like playing being a band and um, all of the other things that you don't get from practicing in a room at your on, on, in your room on your own so um, yeah he come up and he said to me go you don't know what you're bloody doing, do you? Like this. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's awful. I don't want to ever hear that again. So I went off and I, and I made sure next week I knew exactly what I was doing. And, and you know, in <laughs> one sense, that, that there's something appropriate about that because the, the jazz kind of commitment is, mm. is rigour, isn't it? It really is practice. It's yeah. hard work. You can't yeah. just fake it mm. or hope that you'll be good or yeah. mess around. Tell me about the relative relationship between form and playing, you know, songs that you know and standards or, or, or kind of learning about form and improvisation. How did they, how did he deal with that in, was that, were they teaching you to improvise at the same time? No, it was, it was, it was, yes, yes and no. So it wasn't like, Ian's classes weren't sort of like very prescriptive. He wouldn't do chalk and talk. He didn't give any handouts. It was all very practical. And I tend to, you know, I've got a few students that are here and I think in my group, workshops I tend to do the same thing I just want us to play and practice as a rehearsal like as, as professional musicians so but he didn't let you solo all the time so when you got that solo that was your moment and you needed to grasp it otherwise you might not get to solo again for the rest of the class so it was very it was it was quite sort of like competitive in that sense mm. so he you you had to say something you had to say something meaningful musically within the space that you were given and so that's the that's where the pressure Came. Did he play with you? Yeah, yeah. And that must have been quite exciting. I mean, how, how do you rate him when you think about him as a musician? How do you rate him as a musician and a yeah, composer? It was all, all awesome, you know. I mean, you know, some of some of the, some of the stuff that Ian did was, um, you know, very much in the in the vein of Miles, and he loved Miles so much that he was like purely sort of like based his whole sound off of Miles. You know, he was like the the biggest fan of Miles. You mm. know, so but. Um, with that came a lot of like the philosophy that he'd studied when I was on the roads with Miles, you know, a lot of talking to Miles. So he, he brought that in. And so you'd get nuggets of like, you know, lived experience and lived, you know, empirical wisdom as opposed to somebody saying, oh, this is what Coltrane said at some point. He's like, I was on the, on the road with Miles and Miles told me this. <laughs> you, you that know. comes with certain, a certain amount of authority. Yeah. What's interesting about that as well is, I mean, it, at different times, it's been different, but there is, there has historically been this thing in, within jazz. Uh, I, you know, some people call, refer to it as the jazz police, mm. the idea that only certain things are meant to be jazz, and if you deviate from that, you have betrayed the spirit of jazz. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like with, I mean, Ian Carr. One of the, th I mean, I came to Ian Carr because I'm not, I wasn't a real, I didn't know a great deal about jazz, but I knew about dance music. But the yeah. connection there was the fusion, was the band like Nucleus, was this quite funky, 
stuff, which clearly was influenced by what Miles Davis had done, which is kind of leave traditional jazz behind at mm. a certain point in the 70s. Yeah. And for a while, that was quite potent and quite popular, but it didn't kind of, it didn't seem to lead anywhere in some one sense. It kind of, it was quite a, it was quite a move which was controversial up to a point in the jazz world. Was that, did you have a feeling about that? Yeah, I mean, there was one point when I said to him, look, I really want to get my straight ahead playing together. He's like, well, then don't come here. He said, I'm not going to do that stuff here. Uh, it was really clear. And he said, look, we're just going to, we're going to play contemporary music. So we'd learn weather report tunes and we'd learn his tunes. I mean, the most kind of straight ahead we'd probably do is like Horace Silver, you know. And he's like, he said, well, you know, Miles doesn't even want to play all blues. Why should we play all blues? And that was around the time that Miles had released a Mandla with Marcus Miller producing. Which is a whole nother, a whole, whole nother thing. And yeah. obviously after On the Corner and then moving towards T2 yeah. and all of this uh, kind of deviation from the norm. From yeah. the, Tell me about that in terms of, you know, how you negotiated that world as you moved out of the class and started to become... What, at what point did you become, or did you think of yourself as a professional musician? I started... Um, I took a sort of gap year, but... It, I say I took a sort of gap year because I'm, I am you know, come from a very working-class family, so I wasn't even really aware of the options that were available to me. I actually applied to go here and I got a place. I should have come here. They didn't have a piano at the time. Oh. Yeah. Our <laughs> yeah. loss. Yeah, and I, well, my loss too, because it's a great, it's a great place and really open-minded. And and thank you for having me. I, have oh, to, I meant to say it's, that. It's I'm, I'm such a pleasure. So honestly. happy to be here. And you can play this piano anytime. Not I'm, just I'm, I'm, I'm be in back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so you but, applied um, here to do music. Yeah, I, and I came and there was this whole like you know ethnomusicology day, and I, you know I came to a few of the open days and for different things, and I was this close to coming because I was studying a little bit of sitar at um, Centre for Young Musicians as well, and there was a little bit of a time when I thought, well, maybe I should not look at the piano. Go a maybe, bit worldy. In yeah, and I started becoming more, f you know, in touch with and in tune with my. Asian roots as well and I thought do I need to explore that a bit more and I still feel actually as an artist I feel like I do need to explore that a bit more and you know this would have been the perfect place but it's never too late right I sign up yeah. for next September Absolutely I'll see you in a couple right. of months come, yeah. on, come on back <laughs> but um yeah and I was on this like kind of gap year but it was kind of like a gap year that happened just because I didn't I you know i got into certain places but then didn't go and then I went to Goldsmiths doing a foundation degree but I didn't really know what it was I just wanted to study jazz so I ended up going to like loads of different gigs loads of different workshops that I could find any jazz musician that came over to Ronnie's I was like oh, I need to get a lesson and back in the day it was a bit more informal loads of people would like Chuchu Valdez from Iraqueris to have a piano lesson in the room above Ronnie Scott so there was a piano up there and um, he would give me lessons People would, that's kind of the culture. People would just have this whole exchange of ideas. And it wasn't like they were necessarily even charging for lessons. They just want to pass on the knowledge. And there was a real culture of, of that happening. I mean, a sort of transatlantic uh, community, really, even with like um, all of the Warriors lot and the Marsalis brothers, and they were all like really close friends. So, mm. you know, there was, it wasn't, there wasn't social media, so the, it became who the social side of it became who you. So there was a lot of hanging out. There was a lot, lot of spending out. time at Ronnie's, right? And, and that's other. how you got your stuff together. That was my university. I always say Ronnie's was my uni. Yeah. You know, um, which is a great place to study, really. Uh, well, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've mentioned a few times, uh, well, well uh, Ira Kerry, and yeah. I just wonder if you, you know, because I feel like I want to get you to play again, but I just wonder if there's mm. something along those lines. You mentioned that you learnt the clave from. I mean, I'm quite ignorant <laughs> about music, but um, the, the sort of structure of Afro-Cuban music sounds yeah. like it sort of was something that was quite important to you, is that? Yeah, I lived in Cuba for six months, oh, so yeah, that was Were a lot of fun. Were you kind of chasing the Cuban music? A little bit, yeah, but um, yeah, I don't know if it's, no, I don't know, yeah, I'm not really prepared anything with okay, a, with a clave right. well, in it. Well, I, I, I want you to play something, but we'll, mm. we'll find a way to, mm. to weave that in. So tell me about, so you're in the band at the moment, I think, um, with people that you were at that school with, at that uh, Ian Carr. Oh, they uh, Mark and Michael. Yeah, they they were there before me. They were there before you. Yeah, so, so they're older. So tell us older. about tell us about that band, and um, it's called Ultimatum. Infinitum. Infinitum. I'm sorry. <laughs> Infinitum. Yeah. So um, um, Mark and Michael Mondesi, two incredible musicians. We 
Uh, we're going to be on telly in a couple of weeks if you want to watch that. It's BBC, uh, BBC Young Jazz Musician. Oh, so yeah, I'm because musical you were the musical director. director of that. Yeah, yeah, I'm musical director again this year and Mark and Michael were in, in that band. So I met Mark, he, I actually met Mark at my school because I, at Islington Sixth Form, we had four weeks of, uh, it was Julian Joseph, Mark Mondesi, Wayne Batchelor and John Toussaint came into the school every single week for four weeks. And I met Mark when I was 16 and I met his brother around the same sort of time and played some stuff to them and they were like, oh, we need to hang. So first, one of the first pieces I wrote um, for that particular lineup that wasn't, um, actually wasn't Mark, it was Keith LeBlanc was in the band at mm -hmm. the time from Tack Hill Sugar Hill, Tackhead Sugar Hill Gang. Uh, was called Dance of the Two Small Bears. I could play that one if oh, you that want. That would be lovely, yeah. It's got a bit of a story to it, though. Would you like to hear the yeah. story? Oh, I think so, yeah? yes. <laughs> yeah? You're sitting comfortably? <laughs> then you'll Are begin. You? Yeah, then I'll begin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so once upon a time, there were, there were two bears in a forest. Yeah? There's a man bear and a woman bear. Stay with me. Right? <laughs> the man bear, he, he sees the woman bear, and he wants to dance with her. So he goes over to her to ask her to dance. And he says, this is going over there. He remembers he can't, can't do that because he's a bear. Bears don't talk. Then he remembers there's a language, a bear language, which actually, you know, you can, you can still communicate. So he starts to dance, which means in bear language, would you like to dance? So anyway, she gets up and she starts to dance as well, which in bear language means yes. All right. <laughs> so he's, yeah. he's a tiny little bear. And she's quite, quite a big statuesque bear. But he, he doesn't care. He's all about the inner bear. He, he loves, he's like, oh, this is great. She's a great big bear. He's cool with that. He's a, he's a yeah, open-minded guy. He does the washing up and all of those. Th yeah, a modern guy. Yeah, he's a modern guy. <laughs> and romantic. It's like it's a figment of someone's imagination. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so he changes his dance steps to fit with hers. And you'll hear this in the piece. Yeah? Big bear, little bear. And then they fall in love. Ah, oh. oh, that's it. And when I was 19, when I wrote this piece, I thought to myself, that's it. And that's how it ends, right? And then I realized that actually, maybe life and relationships, it's not always like that. Oh. Yeah, no, sometimes the kids, they go to university and spend all your money, but they don't go to lectures. <laughs> right. Don't say that. No, no. My sometimes son's <laughs> at university right now. <laughs> yeah, <I'm not. laughs> sometimes they split up, right? Sometimes they argue. But, you know, what is important about this piece is what I learned you know, from when I became a professional musician, still not fully answered that question. No, but um, yeah, but um, you know, what I learn is that life doesn't always um, work out as you want. And sometimes it does. But what I do realize is when you perform, the audience's energy really has an effect on the improviser, you know. So we'll see at the end of this piece what happened to the bears. Because so it's, it's different up to every you time. If there's a happy ending yeah? or a sad All ending, right? right? Here we Give go. The energy. The dance of the two small bears.
Thanks. A happy ending or sad ending? I couldn't quite be sure. It's like a. Uh, can we have a vote? Like a long marriage. Yeah, happy or sad ending? Happy? 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 Sad? <laughs> to me, it felt like a long, successful marriage where you're never quite sure, even at the very end. Do you have a happy marriage or a sad marriage? But you're still together. That's how it felt to me. Yeah. Wonderful. You were 19 when you wrote that. Indeed. To return to an earlier question, were you a professional musician at the time when you wrote that? Yeah. I, um, I sort of was doing gigs, um, like I used to play in a, in a bistro in Smithfield Market called, uh, was it, it was a Farringdon Bistro or something like that. Some Just pizza place. Some sort of yeah, it's a play for pizza yeah, and a tenor, I think it was. Yeah. But it was quite, yeah, it was, pizza was good. Piano, <laughs> piano was a bit ropey, but yeah. Um, uh, I started being a professional musician, I say, well, weirdly enough, I feel like w when I was about eight or nine, I played in a pub, right? Um, in near Exmouth Market. Pubs used to have pianos and people used to play. It was a, it was a regular like theme. Regular thing, yeah. yeah, and there was a guy who just finished his set and then I said, oh, can I play? I think I played like Edelweiss or something, Sound of Music piece. And then they had a whip round in the pub, you know, they had the hat and uh -huh. they put, just took a glass around <laughs> so I could buy myself a packet of crisps. And, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I had family. I wasn't like going out trying to make, I wasn't going out to make money for the crisps, but you, you know what I mean? But, like, but you wanted to play. Yeah, but somebody, the most important thing about that is someone said, to me now you've received money for playing you're professional there we go so i think i considered myself as a professional from then okay that, that makes sense and yeah it was the validation i needed yeah because and i've been practicing in my room up until that and clearly that time, you'd you made know? such a commitment to this that it, it was starting to appear that that's what you were going to do with your life wasn't it well that was when i was seven playing in the pub and then <laughs> 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 okay. a little bit later on then. yeah a little bit later on but so the first i said say the first kind of break through i had i was doing a few other little gigs on the scene when i was like you know doing my a levels and stuff and then i went to the jazz cafe in camden when I was 18, and there was a jam session with all these amazing musicians, Lonnie Plaxico from the Embase Collective, Steve Williamson, Courtney Pine, and um, the piano player who was due to sit in at the time had had a fit of nerves, and so he'd left the building. And um, basically, the uh, guy who was running the jam session, Gary Crosby, Gary, yeah. from Toronto's Warriors, he said, oh, if you want to, is anybody out there want to come and sit in and play the piano? Um, our piano players had a fit of nerves, um, but you have to be able to cut it. And that terrified oh. me. I was like, oh, well, I don't know about that. I don't know if I can do that. So uh, my mates were like, I think, I think you were there. I don't know. Yeah. My sixth form friend. Um, <laughs> a couple of mates were like... Was he yeah. egging you on? on? Yeah, they were like, go on, go on. So I actually did. They were about to stop playing. And then they were, the piano player... He had quite tall, I tucked him on the shoulder. I said, do you mind if I, the house piano player, who we're just going to cover for the guy who didn't do it. I said, do you mind if I sit in? So he said, nice, no, fine, no problem. He looked at me like, are you sure? You're a girl? Like a little bit like, <laughs> you know, and it was quite unusual. So I sat in and as we're playing, playing like a blues, I think we played like, I think we, I think we played like Billy's Bound. You know? a bit wrong there but anyway but I think we played Billy's Bounce and um, Courtney Pine was playing and it was quite a fast tempo and all of that and I was being a bit roasted but um, when it comes to my solo Courtney was like looking at me over these like little glasses you know in the 90s people had little tiny shades like round like yeah. that he's looking at me over these glasses and I was terrified I thought oh, he's going to tell me to give up 100% he's going to tell me to give up and um Everyone was like, give me a round of applause. I was like, okay, novelty factor. They don't see many girls getting up there. You know, not confident at all. Really sort of full of self-doubt. As you are when you're a teenager, as you can be as a musician. And um, anyway, I was about to leave the venue after this um, event, after the jam session. And Gary come and tapped me on the shoulder. And he said, Courtney wants a word with you in the dressing room. So I went to the dressing room. I thought he's definitely going to tell me to give up. And as I went to the dressing room, he basically asked me, he said, where are you coming from? And I thought, is that musically? Is that ethnically? Or what, 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 what? <laughs> what a question. Spiritually, yeah. <laughs> and I just like, I was like, Islington? Like, you know. And a couple, he took my number and a couple of months later, he called me to 
uh, step in for Beggy Um Seleku, fantastic South African mm. pianist who's no longer with us, sadly. Great album on Blue Note of his called uh, Timelessness. Check that out if you aren't aware of his. See some people nodding. They know about mm. people know about Beggy in this room. It's a good crowd. Um, but yeah, so they they got me to um, depth for Beggy, and then after that, Beggy went and done his own thing. That album included, and I was in the band for about three years. Were you? Yeah, it was great. It was got to travel and play to big audiences and wow yeah Did really you play in liverpool university by any chance? you know what i actually think we might have done because i was a student there and i, I remember, remember you seeing courtney you pine the front, weren't you casper no i'm joking <laughs> 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 what i remember was courtney came on and yeah. played like a couple of sort of choruses and then he just went for it like sounds about time. right yeah and he really was most it was the most sort of overwhelming experience especially from a non for a non-jazz person i found it quite terrifying in a way but Mm. Stayed with me all that time. I yeah. can't remember who was playing the piano. Maybe it was you. Wicked. But so tell me, because I did promise we'd get to this, just for the, so we've, f that's the kind of Coltrane-inspired end of jazz, but for the hip-hop crowd, I can see we've got quite a hip-hop crowd in. Mm. Tell me about The Roots. How did you manage to you join The Roots? I mean, well, how did that happen? Yeah, I was, um, it was a time when there was a lot of, like, so this transatlantic thing would happen when people would just come and hang out. So Steve Coleman's from Philadelphia, um, uh, some of the roots and there was a they would always spend quite a lot of time in London doing gigs and stuff well the roots were here actually they were living here for a bit so it was a, a mutual friend of, of, of ours Anthony Tids from quite sane plays in Steve Steve Coleman's bass player now mm -hmm. he he was like he introduced me to them and they were like yeah we want Nikki to be in the band so we I was in the band for about probably about a year maybe two years but um, they wanted me to be a, to, to carry on and I was like I'm I'm a, I'm a, I want to play jazz you know, at the time, I mean, we did Montreux Jazz Festival. It's actually online somewhere. Sorry. I'm put, put the, root, the Roots played at Montreux Jazz Festival. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I did that gig with them in 94. That's a long time ago, isn't it? God, time, <laughs> yeah. time fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, um, uh, and then upstairs, Al Dimiola was playing. And I remember just like, I really enjoyed the gig, but I remember thinking, it just wasn't challenging me musically. Yeah. You know, there's one tune called Dat Scat, which I love. And don't get me wrong, I love hip hop. But Dat Scat goes like this. I can see it's not using all of your, <laughs> yeah, of your many talents. So yeah, and at the time, you know, I mean, it's, it's a great, it's, I mean, it's, the thing is when you've got the drums, you've got the bass, you've got an amazing, I mean, Tariq, Black Thought. It's isn't it? Black Thought, wonderful. <laughs> Those of you who don't know The Roots, Genius. I mean, check them out. And, and they, they played of such an important part. I mean, if you go to a Roots gig, they yeah. will give you a potted history of hip hop from the beginning to the end every time. While we're on the subject then, because you played, did you play on Pro C2 as well? Yeah. Can you just, what, what's the piano bit in Pro Oh, you know, I can't, it, you can't ask me to remember, it's a long time ago, man. Is I'm it? getting, yeah. I'll go have a COVID I it's, Because <laughs> I was listening to it today, trying to pick out the piano You know what, I will, I will, next time, I will have right, that ready for I you, was, man. Yeah, that's all right. But it's, it's still a nice, so that was your kind of alternative life, where you could have been a kind of American, you know, sort of yeah, hip-hop Jimmy Fallon superstar. Show. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy Fallon. Yeah, I could be a ride really at Universal, the most surreal moment, because, you know, these were my mates, and, you know, I loved, I did, I absolutely loved playing with the Roots, and I've still got mad respect for them. Love Quest, love, love those guys. And what was brilliant is that they didn't, there wasn't many people, actually anybody, really pl using live instruments. No, that was a big thing, to the, live, the live band thing. Was you know, and then, because I was playing with Keith LeBlanc, which gave my trio at the time a, a different kind of hip-hop kind of, broke a, like a beats orientated kind of sound yeah you know all of my stuff I'd write would be quite jagged like <laughs> it's kind of like quite spiky angular kind of music and Keith would put some kind of hip-hop beats behind that and even though it was like jazz but hip-hop so it kind of gave my stuff a new kind of different kind of sound but um what was my point is um yeah, so even though I, I, I loved all of that stuff, I really also wanted to continue flourishing and getting my chops together and doing all of that. And yeah, I never saw it as something that was separate from... Um, oh, yeah, the, I was going to say, sorry, I lost my train of thought. The most surreal moment was when I went to Universal and there's a ride and the roots are a hologram in a ride. <laughs> really? Yeah, so there's a whole ride in, and it's like... In, like a, um, in you could have been a hologram. I could have been oh, a hologram. and You I'm could have <laughs> been a contender. Tell me about but, yeah. then... This brings us on to the kind of negotiating the, the world of jazz in two ways, really, and you mm. can take it however, which way, whichever way it feels like. So jazz has been and been perceived to be something which is quite white, quite mm. male, mm. Um, you know, 
quite sort of upper class in a way in, in England has become, but you're, you know, not that. So how did, how did you sort of negotiate your way through that? And the other sort of side of that is also how do you build a career? How do you pay the bills? Mm. I mean, because jazz has always been a somewhat of a minority pursuit and a, you know, a, a niche. I have so representation. Well, yeah, obviously you've got a <laughs> good manager. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Make sure you get what you need. But, I mean, how, tell, tell me about how, how you negotiated through that world of, you know, British jazz mm. and found your space within it, both sort of economically and in terms of identity. Yeah, that, well, that's a big question. I know, there's um, a lot there. Yeah, there's a lot. Which bit do you want me to answer first? Because I don't know, whatever, yeah. whatever sort of strikes you. Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I never, I never wanted the fact that I'm a woman to get in the way of me being a jazz musician. Because, and I never wanted, I don't just identify with music that's played by women either. You know, that's also a really weird... <laughs> that would be a bit weird, yeah. Well, you say that, but people come up to you and they'll say, have you heard of Patrice Russian? I'm like, yeah, she's absolutely amazing. But I've also heard of McCoy Tyner, who happens to be a bloke. So it's, it's really weird that even now, people's perception is that if you're a woman, a woman in jazz, that you're going to follow this lineage of women in jazz. So people are like, oh, I really love Alice Coltrane. I'm like, yeah, I do too. Mm. But I also love Hermeto, you know. Or, like, you know, it's, it's, it's strange. So I ha I've always found there's, there's been lots of prejudice. And up until recently, I think it was one of the few careers where people haven't really spoken about, um, you know, women in that in, in, in jazz and now people of the conversations that, opened that up. That is changing, you think? Yeah, yeah. definitely. It's, it's definitely changing and I'm, I'm really happy about that. There seems to be more racial diversity in British jazz yeah. now as well. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the musicians we talked about, mm. um, albeit you know, many of the musicians you mentioned were black, it was mm. a relatively small part of the jazz scene. In fact, it was mm. you know, th those, you know, the, the, the lineage of um, the jazz warriors into Courtney Pine. I mean, it, they all knew each other. And they actually were quite, it's not that they were militant, but they were very aware that they yeah. were fighting for space for black musicians. Yeah. And that seems to have paid off in some ways because now mm. the British jazz scene seems to be much more diverse. Yeah, Is I mean, let's not get confused because there was also loose tubes that were really like open-minded yep. and come up at the same time. So loose tubes and warriors. But the, the old guard before that, that held all of the positions of power, held all the, the keys to the gigs, they weren't letting any of the young black guys in at the time. Yeah. So the Warriors was all about, basically, they were like, well, you're not letting us play, so we'll have to create our own way, places to play. And actually, that is what created the scene that we have today. So the shoulders that we stand on are, are the shoulders of the jazz warriors. And also loose tubes as well. We've been very open-minded as well. So it, we mustn't forget that their contemporaries were not of that mentality. So that generation... Yeah, they, they had a lot of doors to push through. But I think it's always like that with art. There's always going to be the gatekeepers that don't want anything new coming through. I mean, you had Steam Down here the other day. Yep. I think a lot of people criticised Steam Down because, you know, they're not playing, they're playing straight ahead even. And it's like, but straight ahead's like almost 100 years old as well. I mean, not that I love straight ahead, but, yeah. you know, there's room for Steam Down well, too. Wayne right? had a really interesting answer to that, which I hadn't yeah. really considered, where he said that, well, we're pulling from traditions which are both like African-American traditions mm. and the Caribbean and yeah. West Africa, and it's not like that in America. It was almost implying that the American jazz language was slightly more limited than the diasporic language that's available to the black musician in Britain who's yeah. pulling from a, a wider palette. But yeah, L L all like in London, Birmingham, you know, um, Manchester, all of the places where um, you have um, more diverse population you know your your music is going to reflect your your heritage and it's going to reflect your life experience it ought to if you're being authentic to your own um, self and your own art your art should reflect your life and so therefore because we have more mixing going on and we're, we're less sort of segregated in America than America I think it's pretty much a, more of a melting pot of different sounds different cultural influences and plus you know in London specifically we have a certain our own thing going on as well we do kind of yeah don't we? yeah um, I should just say that there will be time for some audience questions, so, so I will be getting to you, don't worry. We're get, there's a few more things I want to uh, hear from Nikki and you know, perhaps play another, another something, but let's get on. You are now yourself a teacher, mm. aren't you? You're following in this tradition that you've picked up from Ian. I mean, do you, you, you obviously feel that you're not just doing it to pay the bills. Mm. Right, you're yeah. doing it because you've got some kind of. I love what I love teaching. So I've got some of my students are here. So I've got to say that. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> I see you. <laughs> tell it, tell <laughs> how did you get into it, and what are you? You're, you're associated with a variety of different uh, sort of teaching outlets at the moment. Yeah, I've been lecturing at Leeds uh, Conservatoire for a year now, so I'm a principal lecturer there, which 
is, is, wow. is lovely to, yeah. An academic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're a bit cockney, though. But a cockney academic. academic. Yeah. <laughs> the best kind. Yeah, but that's really, that's really great because I just get to explore jazz for, like, all the time I'm there. It's just, it's so creative. I'm absolutely loving loving that and I think it's I love hanging I love well, I said love hanging around with young people I love working with young people as well because you get the energy and the creativity <coughs> and then it challenges your thinking and, and it refreshes my passion for the music because I'm like oh you've not heard this oh man we've got to play this tune or you've got to hear this and it keeps that energy alive for me as well you know as you sometimes jazz music could get a bit like stuck in your ways and not be challenged and you know yeah but uh, I've always taught I've always taught um, ever since. It's always been a simultaneous thing for me. And, uh, yeah. So there's something about the playing and the teaching, you know, the inf informally but also in these other in, uh, sort of spaces, which is part... Because there's something about being a jazz musician which seems built in that you need to keep... I mean, I know we all should be learning all the time. Yeah. But presumably some musicians' careers are about, a little bit as you demonstrated with The Roots, repeating yourself over and over again in bigger and bigger venues, right? Which mm. is not really what jazz is like. You're pushing yourself in different directions. I think there's always been, a, there's a Brazilian saying that says, if you bring someone up a step, then you can move up a step yourself. So I've always had this philosophy of actually passing it on in order, because that nourishes me, like I said, you know, the creative side of me. If I'm passing it on, I'm exploring different ideas as well. And then when you get feedback and other young people bring in stuff to the class so then you're being fed creatively as well but also like I'm really keen on not teaching in a way that it's quite that jazz is often taught which is very much from a harmony harmony perspective harmony is great and I love harmony and it's really super important but the most of the um, academic institutions focus primarily on harmony mm -hmm. and not necessarily on the other things that make you attracted to the music so you know the interplay between musicians the the music the um the rhythm you know um phrasing all of those things it's pretty much all like mostly harmony um so i've whenever i've been teaching in camden for 26 27 years i started the sat my saturday morning course there i think 27 years ago and uh, the head of music at Camden at the time said, oh, you know, what would you like to do? And I said, I want to have a jazz band. And, you know, lots of great musicians have passed through through the, my doors, for, for, through, the, through going to that class. And I think because I've always just treated everybody like you're going to be a professional musician. So, it, in a, but it, with a bit more love than Ian did, right? Because, <laughs> you know. Like he was from tougher times, as you <laughs> yeah. said. You know, imagine if you'd been have to do the army and stuff and get up well, and be yeah. shouted at by a sergeant major. Maybe it, that's, you know, but you, how yeah. you learn. But what he did inspire me to the way I teach is to really just see everybody as individuals too and, and take everybody seriously. And, and you know, those, class, those classes are serious for me because, you know, that's the, the time of the week that those young people have a chance to really do what they love. And I, I thought it's a great honour to be able to facilitate that mm. and get them to where they want to be. And I find great pleasure in that, and um, it's very and you've rewarding. Got these, um, you've got these videos on YouTube. I highly recommend search for Nikki O on YouTube, and she'll, there, there's these videos <laughs> you explaining how to uh, some some hints and tricks about about um, improvisation. Was that something? Was that a lockdown thing? Or was That's that something I, I, I refused to do anything on in lockdown that was like I didn't want to be filmed playing. I didn't want to do any live kind of all of those things. But Music for Youth approached me to do some um, tutorials, like mini sort of like my top tips for it. Top tips, that's yeah. right, yeah. So I thought, you know what, actually, all these young people, these kids are lock, locked up and not being able to go out would be great if they could be guided in a certain way. So, I, yeah, for them, I did it. Yeah, and yeah. the feedback on there, um, you, have you read the comments? You no, should. no, they're really, I haven't. They're <laughs> so sweet. And oh. they're saying, what a beautiful teacher and how nice that you're so mm. open. And I think there's a real sense that you're more like them than they would imagine a teacher oh. would be. Well, that's really nice. I don't usually read comments because people write, might, might write me. No, things, I recommend that you do. They're really <laughs> sweet. Um, so bring us up to date a little bit. You're working on a project which has the wonderful name of Nucleus, which mm. is, of course, the great fusion band that Ian Carr formed, which is just, you know, magnificent. Is it, it's called Nucleus. Is it a reference to that in particular? Yes. And what, what is the Nucleus project? Tell us about that. Sure. Um, so uh, the National Youth Jazz Orchestra commissioned me to write a, write a new piece for them. Um, and they're sounding really great. Like I heard them playing with Hermeta Pasquale at the Barbican recently. I was, I was absolutely blown away. They're killing it. 
some great musicians in there. Oh my gosh, there's a piano player in there called Andrew Chen. It's absolutely, he's, am, he's amazing. He's, mm. Anyway, so I digress. But they've they commissioned me to write an, a piece for them which is going to be premiered next year. And um, be, I was thinking about, you know, education. And also Nigel used to be not as open-minded as WAC. There was like WAC and Nigel. So it's Ian's class and Nigel. And Nigel is where you got your sight reading together. But it was all blokes in a different way. Like Ian's class was all boys, but these guys were like, the, the worst side of male energy <laughs> that I, I'm sure nobody in this room possesses that energy, right? But they were the worst side. So, the, you know, they really, really didn't make any me, they wouldn't make me feel comfortable. Uh -huh. So you were, this is the National I Youth I went to Jazz two Orchestra. sessions. Just two. And yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then the, the, the main guy at the time come up to me, a bit like Ian, come up to me and said something. He goes, yeah, not bad for a girl. The main guy said Yeah, that. yeah. And so it made me feel really uncomfortable. Yeah. But, you know... So I, when they first asked me to write a piece, I was a bit like, oh, man, I, I don't know. But then we had a really long chat about diversity, and they're so open now, and they're, they're really... They've changed their oh, style. Oh, they're, they're fantastic. They really, mm -hmm. are, they really are brilliant, and they've really gone out of their way to try and, you know, be as inclusive as possible. There's some amazing young women coming out of there, Asha Parkinson, Emma Rawwich, who's an amazing saxophonist. So they've got, like, you know, and this is brilliant. So I'm looking forward to working with them next year because they're great musicians and the piece nucleus i thought well that it's got to be linked to ian because it's like there's this whole like whack and niger you bringing them back together then? bringing it all idea? back yeah, full yeah, circle yeah. right ah, nice. and uh, so the piece starts off with a requiem for ian because he was one of my mentors and i miss him dearly he would he would have been 90 next year mm. and uh, and i'll be 50 next year so we've like it's just like we would have had a big old party but he's not around you know so this is the way i can celebrate him so there's a requiem, and then it, are and you are you moving through all the styles? Is there going to be some nice fusion bits in there as well? It's all pretty. Um, it's all through composed, and with with um, some sections for improvising. So it's not like an A A B A piece that's just big band scored. It's all very much orchestrated through composed, mm. and I also um, rearranged for Nigel a piece that I wrote in '97 called Speech Mick Exploration. And that project um, was based on a poem, so I'm glad we've got a poet in the house. Um, it was a, it was a, yeah, <laughs> it was a poem that I wrote called Speech Mick Exploration that I trans I got different friends of mine at the time to translate it into their relative languages. So Polish, um, Osa, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, Italian, um, Urdu, and Mandarin, and I filmed them and have the, uh, their faces projected onto the back of the wall. And um, like Hermeta Pasquale, who's one of my influences, he um, puts a lot of music to speech. You probably see these things on Instagram. It all comes out of Hermeto. All of it comes out of Hermeto. So if he's talking, he'll harmonise the speech. And I was very interested in that. So I did that in 97, and the whole piece comes out of um, the harmonised speech. So every single... A movement has got a different phrase that comes out of the harmonised speech. And the poem is, speech make exploration is the creation of all in every nation. Through word, art or motion, it's still a musical potion. The positivity of this creativity is to communicate with it the spiritual meaning of justice and equality. Wow. <laughs> Can't wait. Where can we see that? Yes. <laughs> Where and when can we see that? Then? That is going to be um, in 2023. Dates yet to be confirmed. But I guess if you go to either my Instagram or Nigel's Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, um, I think I'm Nikki Piano Yo on Twitter. Then you know I'll let you guys know about it. I'd love to see you there. It's going to be it's going to be hench. Yeah, hench yeah. exactly. <laughs> and one more thing, you mentioned to me that you've got a gig coming up at the Vortex, a different yeah. kind of thing altogether. The Vortex is this wonderful yeah. little. You've been to Vortex, haven't you, in Dudusi? Yeah, this legendary, really, London jazz mm. venue. It's moved a couple of times, but it was set up by a guy who's a black cab driver, yeah. who was a jazz nut. Um, and it's kind of it's still f uh, staffed by volunteers primarily, isn't it? It's a brilliant it's, space. And it's just an incredible... It's been refurbed, actually. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, went, I went halfway through the refurb and you had to sit downstairs while mm. they were redoing it upstairs. It's really nice, yeah. So what are you going to be doing there? Well, at the time when I was going to Weekends Arts College, I had a real passion also for free jazz. Ah, yeah. 
You, so, could, you could get with it, could you? Like, yeah, I was so into it. And it wasn't hip at all. It was just like, I'd be on my bike, cycling around, and go to these really obscure places. There'd be like a little leaflet that was called Jazz in London. It was an A4 size of piece of paper, and it would fold into like you know, quarters, mm. and you'd get that from... Think up at Ray's Jazz Shop. Or, or Moles like Jazz in Mole King's Jazz, Cross. Yeah. Great jazz record shop, right? So you get this and you see what's going on. And I'd be like, oh, that looks really obscure. Definitely going to go to really? that. Yeah. <laughs> would be like in the back room of a back room, <laughs> behind the back room of a pub upstairs, like five yeah. floors. Right? Someone playing a dustbin lid. And yeah. Sort of yeah. Wind, you know, a, a hose pipe. Definitely. And there'd be like maybe four people in the audience, eight people on stage, you know. Yeah. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's real jazz. Properly. I miss those days, man. I miss those days. I was like, you know, because... It was the, it was so pure. You can ca still catch stuff like that at Vortex. I saw yeah, someone you, you know you who was improv you know tap dancer came along and just joined. Was that Annette? I, I, I don't know. Annette. I, I can't remember She's who it was. She's wicked. Just mm. someone. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I yeah. interrupted you. No, so it's free cool. jazz. Free jazz. So um, I'd go and hear Lowell Coxill, Keith Tippett solo piano. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you Barbican would sell out with those guys now. Do mm. you know what I mean? But it's like, yeah, just random, random, random free jazz, free jazz guys. And one of the bass players that I connected with was a guy called Paul Rogers who's amazing, and we hung out a lot. We used to just play free. He'd just come over and we'd play free. And um, yeah, he was really, really dedicated to improvising and really dedicated to playing free and has a super diligent practice routine. I mean, this cat would practice maybe eight hours a day. I think he still does. Now he lives in France. He doesn't live in London anymore. Much to, It's our loss, I'm afraid, because he's brilliant. But he is over here in January. So we are going to reconnect. I haven't seen him since I was about maybe 18, 19. He's been living in France at that time. So I put, a, put together a project with him, Mark Sanders, and the incredible Evan Parker. Oh, wow. Yeah, 20th of January, Legendary. 20th of January, 2023. It's a way to kick off my 50th cycle around so the So we sun. know the date. Yeah. Have you any idea what's going to be played? It's free, man. So <laughs> <laughs> it's free jazz. Doesn't mean the yeah. So g for those of us who are musically, you know, illiterate, mm. as which is I, I, I very much am. What do we mean by free? What's it free of? Free of, um, free of any kinds of restraints in the sense of no chord chart, no melody, no. Um, no, no one's in control. No, no, one's, no one's in charge. <laughs> well, no one's in control, but no one's in charge. There's no leader as such. You can take an idea and you can extemporize over that idea and it might become a group extemporization where everybody's then playing from that idea. Someone might then decide to go against that idea and it's up to you because you have free will, it's freedom, whether you choose to then go along with their change or you keep to your own. And it's all about feeling. It's all about how you engage with your instrument. But more importantly, it's about the technique, different techniques. You can use the inside of the piano. You can use um, all different textures. You can really explore. And every time I've played free, it's, diff it's obviously different, but there's, I, I learn something about myself as a musician. Mm. Because you have to really search within yourself in order to connect with the musicality that's there. And, and it, you, it, you have to be completely genuine to the moment because you can't just sit behind a, a bunch of licks that you've prepared, semi-prepared, or, or you've played a dozen There's times. nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to hide, yeah. especially with those guys. Like, they take no prisoners. It's, it's a great experience, intense, but... It I sounds incredibly intense. Yeah. Always on the edge of complete chaos, presumably. Yeah. And yeah. that's the danger, and that's the th thrill. Yeah. I mean, like, wow. if you listen to Bitches Brew, Miles Davis's album, that, that, I mean, that's a great example of free jazz. Yeah. And now people are like, oh, can I get a score for that? And it's just like, but that was just come they up. They were making it up. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Nobody <laughs> knew what was going to happen. Yeah. I mean, that's where I did love The Roots, to be honest, because they would come out with, up with stuff like, you know, with jam and with right stuff coming out of a jam session. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Just playing together. And that's just... That's where they're jazz musicians. I, feel like I don't see necessarily a line between jazz and hip-hop in that sense because it's, it's coming from the same sensibility. You yeah, know. yeah, I think so. Nikki, I wonder if you would play us something, whatever st strikes you, whatever you want us to hear, whatever yeah. you want to say to us. I think I'm going to play, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, we've, we've played a song about healing and I've played another one about love. I think I'm going to play something that I wrote um, on I wrote this in um, Snape Moulton. Do you know Snape, Snape Moulton? I know Snape so well. Such my, a my grandmother place. lived in Alborough, and, oh she, and we, 
I, I saw some wonderful music at Snape. It's oh. such a beautiful, haunting place, isn't it? It's, it's fantastic. You're yeah. lucky to have your nan living there. Yeah. My nan lived in St. John's Street. <laughs> yeah, <I know>. Well, <laughs> quite nice nowadays, yeah, St. John. It is. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so um, I was driving down to, um, to, to this artist in residence, the artist in residence residency um, in, Sna in Snape, and... Um, I spoken to my great auntie who was 87 at the time and she'd lost a grown up son already. And then she told me that her other son had been diagnosed with a terminal illness, which is obviously tragic. So I arrived to the studio thinking, you know, I wanted to write and I'm pretty much crying on the inside and didn't, you know, professionals. I'm like, yeah, it's lovely down here at the residency, going to the room. And I just felt this grief overcome. And um, I just sat at a piano and this came out in one go. Wow. Her name was Ivy, and um, as I looked out the window in the studio, there was all this elderflower on the tree. So this place is called Elderflower and Ivy, and it's about grieving in the summertime.
Well, that was, yeah, well, that was really very wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki, and thank you for sharing that. I always that. cry and on that one, sorry. No. It is a way of sharing your emotions with the world, isn't it? I mean, it's, yeah. I can feel it. Um, we've got some time for some questions from you. So please do not feel shy. Put your hand up and ask a question. We've got a, a mic somewhere. Do we have a mic? Yeah. So is there anything that you'd like to say? It could be more of a comment than a question. It doesn't have to be a question. It could be a rap. <laughs> yes, it could be a rap. <laughs> um, over here. Right. Thanks. Oh, do, do you want to take the, just use the microphone, thank you. What is left for you to um, feel that you need to do? You, it sounds like you've come so far, but what would you, in the next 10 years, 20 years, where would you like to be with your music? Oh, wow, that's a, that's a big question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, feel, I still feel like I'm really just on the beginning of a journey. So even though I think my journey started when I was relatif relatively young and I've been doing it for pretty solid few, quite a few years, I definitely always feel like I'm learning. I still feel like I have lots to learn about the jazz idiom. Um, I, I love composing. Ideally, I would love to be doing even more writing. So this, this piece that I write for, written for Nigel has really given me um, so much the whole process has given me a lot of a lot of joy, and um, I realise how much I love composing. Like sometimes composing can be can be um, difficult, actually. Can be you know if you have if a piece like this just came out all in one, but sometimes you've really got to keep chipping away at the block every day, and sometimes it feels like it's a week and you've only written one bar, even though you've been working like you know twelve hours <laughs> a day. <laughs> you know, so but um, I even enjoy that process to be honest. The luxury of thinking time. I would like to award myself the luxury of thinking time a bit more and op open up my artistic space so that more of this can flow through me. That sounds like cinema, like cinema. Nice. Like <laughs> I thought maybe you'd say that cinema works. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely always interested in writing for film. And, yeah, so hopefully that will come about at some point. I can yeah. see it happening. Filmmakers. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. The last piece was amazing. I think all of us we did feel the emotions of the, of of the. Uh, it was really lovely. I don't know whether is it, is it possible or not, but can you describe the feelings with words of the of the of the last piece? Because I did imagine like all the like all the ups and downs with the music and going down. So if it if it is possible to just like give us a description of of the journey of the of the piece itself. Yeah, um, so the first part of the piece is um, I deliberately wrote the voicings on the piano, you know, this bit. So the first chord is a C, it's in C. It's a C major chord, but without the third. And it's got the nine, or the two, really, because there's no seven in there. And it's, it's really clean, yeah? Um, C is the first, first note we really learn on any instrument. So it felt to me that's a, a place of innocence. And then it ends up being in, in a relative minor, which is a place that is traditionally of sadness. So I suppose if I was to analyze it, it's the place of purity and innocence going into somewhere quite dark, which is where you are when you're grieving. And, you know, like a lot of my pieces, because they're it's, it's a jazz piece, the, the end bit was improvised. And today when I ended it, so I ended it in different ways, but today I ended it on just two A's here. Because to me, to that really felt very final when you're grieving. Sometimes grieving is never really final, but their life, somebody you lost, their, their life is final. So it needed to end like a really clean ending to get closure, I guess. Today it felt, when I played that, I, I experienced grieving when I was playing it. I have to get into a zone. For me, it's like a meditation in order to play it from an artistically genuine place that hopefully will move you. Otherwise, if you're just playing the notes, it won't, it won't move you. If you haven't got the intention, the intention behind the note is what makes it music. 
So today it felt like as I went through that grieving process that that person was gone and there was closure. Sometimes it doesn't feel like that. It sometimes still feels like the grieving is going on long after I've played it. So for me, it's always cathartic and hopefully you also feel some release as with audience, you know. That's what art should be about. It's a brilliant description. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question here. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Really enjoyed today's talk and, and the, the performance. Um, a couple of thoughts. Um, when you were having your lessons with the greats, you know, at Ronnie Scott's, was there any sort of standout lesson that someone passed on to you as a, a more mature performer that you could pass on to us? And is there any sort of advice you give your students that you always give the students that might boost their confidence? I mean, you know, coming from a woman who also plays music in a very male world, I mean, I've, I have come to realise it is very gendered. And sometimes you're sitting there surrounded by other guys who are appear to be more confident than we may be you know is there anything you say to your younger students about okay this is how you can boost your own confidence you know any advice you could pass on to us yeah um i don't know if there's one specific answer i think anytime i teach it's always very bespoke i like to get to know the person and find out how they tick and basically try to work through any challenges they have and if confidence is a is you know it comes from different places, right? Sometimes it comes from the physical, technical ability to do something, or it comes from, you know, having overcome a challenge, you know? So I think sometimes if we... But then also to break it down and not feel that if you can't do something, that that's a reflection of your musicality. Anything can be practised, literally, you know? Um, like, I was learning this Barry Harris thing in the, at the beginning of the week. Like, um, it's his thing, so... But it goes, um, Like, I don't want to bore you with Barry Harris's beautiful exercises. It's, but <laughs> oh, it's, 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 <laughs> no, it's such a good, <laughs> it's this gorgeous thing, but it's quite fiddly on the piano. So it's like going up, um, you know, root and then second and then third of a major um, chord. Then it goes up to the two of a um, minor third above. Back to one, two, three, then a minor third above. Anyway, I couldn't do that at the beginning of the week. And I thought to myself, look, these are the kind of things I would set my student. Like, I'm going to give myself a week to get that in every key. And by the end of the week, I did it because every single day I practiced it. And I thought, am I practicing what I preach? I'm telling my students, do it every day and it's going to get easier. But I'm like, when was the last time you did something that you every found? Day. You yeah. know, so I'm like, you know what, yo, you need to do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but now I'm confident I'm playing it in a room of people, right, after a week. So it's giving me a boost. So we can all do that, regardless of what, if that's music or anything. It's repetition, just putting in the time and then not giving ourselves a big... Um, beating ourselves up if we can't do it as fast as Casper. As Casper sit around here and he's like, oh, I can just, I can rinse that. But like, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, we compare ourselves to the day before. And once you compare yourself to yourself yesterday, and if you've moved on a bit, that's great. And just keep on with that energy. You know, we're all on our own path. So, um, yeah, don't, I mean, that doesn't mean that if you hear a great piano play, you shouldn't try and get to where they're at, but do it in your own time. Otherwise, we can sometimes just get in our own way, and then we just end up having stumbling blocks, and then we just don't achieve anything. So, yeah, be kind to yourself. I know it's a, it was one of that, you know, crazy italic writing on Instagram, but I mean, you know, it's just, <laughs> I was saying There's that truth, before yeah. them, you know. Comic Sans. Yeah, yeah, Did that Comic Sans. It did work, didn't it? I feel, I feel like that as well. Oh, great. You are a good teacher. Oh, bless you. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, Indra Dizzy. Hi, Nikki. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for the beautiful playing. Um, I, I must be honest, I, I, you, this is a call and response. When you mentioned Prabhupada uh, Silegu, uh, uh, I kind of, it yanked the South Africans out of me. Yeah. even though I'm afraid in asking this question, but I just wanted to get a sense from you, given that you've interacted at that level of musicianship in the history of of London jazz history. I mean, I just came to contact the music, your music very recently, and it's very honest, by the way, I enjoy it as I'm sitting here. But with, for example, Begim um, Selegu being here, 
and going back around the 1990s, I think late 2000s, mm -hmm. he went and he, he, he put a, a band together and he released one album and then came straight back to the UK because South Africa was not working out for him. Mm -hmm. Based on, on that, I, I guess, understanding, what would you say about the London circuit, jazz circuit, that made him feel like he couldn't go back home after he had been here for so long during exile? That's interesting because I knew Becky pretty well and um, there was a whole wave of um, fantastic South African musicians that came here in the, um, in the 80s, or late 80s, early 90s that really had a, an amazing um, effect on the British jazz scene at the time. And this is, I've taught, you know, in, in my classes, in my uh, workshops, I tried to keep that that notion alive. This is after the Blue Notes, then the next another generation of. No, no, no. It was around. It was around that time. So there was like Dudu Pakwana. Yeah. Exactly. Louis Mahalo. Louis Mahalo. Oh gosh, yeah. What and, a drummer. Um, oh, um, incredible. Brian Abrahams, Mervyn Africa, uh, Begum Seleku, um, and that you know, all the you know the British jazz musicians absolutely loved all of the South African sound and the knowledge that they, these guys were bringing and the vibe and the sound and it was a real kind of blend I mean I know you know Django Bates very inspired by South African jazz and brings a lot of that flavor even now into his playing and he's, he's, he's writing um, so there's been a legacy they've left definitely left their mark I think the open-mindedness at the time in the 80s and 90s of everybody just you know we, we're, we're all in London together we're going to make music together I think maybe that's what attracted Beggy here you know that's why he, he came back he felt he felt accepted and loved um, Eugene Skeef was a big part of that, a great percussionist. Um, you know, he, he also was, we, you know, the, as an audience, the audience loved him too. I mean, he had great gigs and he was doing really well, you know. I don't know if that answers your question. But. But the industry, how, was, how would you compare, if you were to compare it to, for example, other regions, how did they find Okay, I mean, Beggy had a really, really intense manager who got him the blue note deal. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, Russell Herman. So I think, you know, there were opportunities for him here and in New York. I mean, that album, he's got Abby Lincoln on there, Marvin Smitty Smith. Mm. Um, who else um, escapes me now? I think, I think, is Joe Henderson on that album? It's like the lineup. Yeah, mm. it's absolutely incredible. I mean, you know, it's, it's a shame Beggy passed because, you know, he'd, he'd be known as even more now as one of the greats, you know. I mean, I think he could have lived anywhere and, and succeeded, to be honest, but there was, you know, Blue Note isn't everywhere, so he, he went to America, and it's a shame It's a shame he passed away, you know. I'd love to have heard him again now, you know, yeah. What he's doing now, yeah. Oh. Um, we've got time for maybe one or two more. If, uh, yes, we'll come, we'll come to you second. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Go thank on. you. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, uh, thank you for your performance. Thank I just you. wonder, uh, in terms of your uh, writing the new piece of art, because um, mm, you mentioned like sometimes the emotion triggers you to or inspires you to create it a new one. So I just wondering, uh, at that moment, how do you balance the emotional self and the critical self, or let's say the more logical one, because the composition need to be like more logical or more I don't know if I sure. make sense no no yeah. you make a total sense actually um, and for me it's I don't really see a separation to a degree so when I'm composing because I'm self-taught as a composer I didn't study composing formally so and arranging and all of that I literally just go with my ear and my ear is dictated by what I feel so if I'm feeling like a melody needs to go to a certain note, I will have to find the note that resonates to get my message across, whatever that feeling is. It's, like, it's, a, it's a gut reaction. It's exhausting, really, as a process, because everything's you know, much more emotional than cerebral. Not to say in cerebral work can't be exhausting, but it's, I have to really be in touch and in tune with what I'm feeling to write, so, um, because then it feels like it's coming from the place where the message is coming. You know, to me, music is a gift from above, and I'm just a vessel. So for me to deliver that message, then I have to be true to what I'm feeling because then the message is coming through in the right way. 
you know, and that's not to say that there's not a value in using, you know, doing something that's very academic and cerebral and sitting there and thinking, okay, if I use this bunch of notes and I give a counterpoint here, or I put this in the flute and I put this in the clarinets and I put this in the bass, that it's going to have this kind of texture and through empirical knowledge and also listening to, um, to, to stuff, the sort of texture I want to have, you know, obviously there are certain devices that you're going to go to if you think this is going to get that result, but it's still got, I've got to cross-reference it to my spirit all the time. So it's like mind, body, spirit working in tandem. Beautiful. Just here. Thank you, Maria. Uh, yeah, pleasure to see you, Thank you, Nikki, and yeah, listen to your music. Yeah, as, as, you, as everybody mentions, very emotional. You're you're playing. Um, I'd like to ask you about. I mean, uh, what's your experience of like classical music? Mm. And what do you think the connection between like jazz and classical? Because I mean, um, sometimes uh, it always feels like it's like such separate separate thing, right? Even if you look at the uh, all of the like approach, the classical approach versus like, jazz approach, and almost like two different worlds, right? But if you like think back, uh, for example, to Bach and all the Baroque era, they were all improvisers, right? Yeah. They used to write um, for every like p individual like even pupil mm. uh, the pieces right mm -hmm. I mean what do you think in terms of the um, like using different approaches like cross genres and especially like obviously I mean in the in the modern age where you have like a lot of uh, com con contemporary classical composers they exploring a lot of improvisational stuff for example yeah what's your opinion yeah, on that? Yeah it's a really interesting question and I sometimes wrestle with the answer because um, you know, I, something something Barry Harris said. Something Barry Harris said the other day was that jazz is actually the extension of classical music. That classical music kind of stopped, and then jazz just or didn't stop, but jazz continued the um, pushing the music forward. And if you listen to Wayne Shorter, you know, for me, there's no difference in mm. the approach of you know Wayne Shorter harmony or the way he approaches rhythm and melody. This is so unique and so pushing melody forward, not jazz melody or classical melody, but melody, the concept of melody and harmony. And I, I don't know, I didn't, you know, at the time, sorry, I don't know, at the time when jazz was called jazz was a time when that um, it was extremely segregated, black and white in America, and they would use jazz as a derogatory word for the music that African Americans were creating. And so... Why is jazz not just called an extension of classical music? Mm. Is there some racist agenda that it can't be validated as being superior, like kind of cerebral art music? Is that, that's a question I'm putting out there. Like, to me, why is there this division? Because it takes just as much creativity to write a, an, a jazz piece as it does to write a classical piece. Bach, as you say, was an improviser. Scriabin, if you listen to Scriabin, his harmonies, it's pure jazz, you know, Chopin, the, the harmonies, are, it's, it's jazz. So why, why is it all of a sudden there's this division? Yes, there's improvisation, but you know it's not being awarded the same financial status as classical music. And why is that? Is it because it's music of a black origin? You know. Mm. Well, there's an image, isn't there? There's an image of the drug, the drug taking. You know, you only got to watch the film around midnight with mm -hmm. um, Dexter Gordon. It's, I mean, it's a great film, but it's a, at the time it was very controversial because it was like saying that all jazz musicians are drug addicts, and we're not. You know, mostly into juicing and, and, <laughs> <laughs> and that vegan kind cheese. of has changed a little bit, hasn't <laughs> yeah, it, from yeah. back in those days? Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean. Um, I don't see a separation. I definitely, I mean, the work like some of Steve Coleman's doing, you hear like, you know, Maria Schneider's or orchestrations. Oh, yeah. Y you yeah. know, um, you hear all of these great composers and original, I mean, Hermeta <laughs> Pasquale. To me, it's, it's, their, it's, it's their own unique voice. So for me, you know, Hermeta Pasquale, his he's, uh, musical journey and, and message is as pure and as, as um, uh, authentic as Chopin. You know, 
and if hopefully in 100 years time, 200 years time, we'll listen to Duke Ellington and we'll listen to Ahmad Jamal with the same kind of mindset as we would have listened to um, uh, Schubert, you know, and let, yeah. Here, here. Um, thank you. Th thanks for the question. And your yes. answers have been <laughs> amazing, Nikki, as well. Thank um, you. I wonder if there might be time for a poem. Um, as I said at the beginning, a couple of our students here have been creatively responding to what's been going on tonight. Mm. Tu Aurora has been writing a poem as we speak, so I think she's going to read it to us. Um, good evening, Nikki. Good um, evening. Good evening to everyone. So I wrote this um, observatory piece just by observing the room and everyone. Titled Thinking Through Music. The room is filled slowly, casually, everyone chatted and laughed. Hannah, oh how poised and pretty she looked, fidgeting but you'd never know. Nikki, there's no single word that can describe your great talent and presence on stage. I'd swear your fingers has a brain of their own. Like the waves, they keep ebbing and flowing and ceaselessly ceases, ceases, ceases transforming. From rhythm, we the audience are transported. I tried to connect your body to your fingers, but the story of peace and tranquility in your, in your face wasn't matched with a hypnotic story of a mystery in your hands. Like a dandelion in the wind, we the audience flew through a field to field. It is, it is as subtle, it is as, subtle as, as the autumnal afternoon that this is, a mixture of fading daylight and swirling lift, but it doesn't go, it doesn't wrap up warmly. It isn't it isn't something that can be guessed. It's a confusing mixture of love, pain, romance, separation, and much beyond that. Thinking through music, your pieces I couldn't really understand. The audience sits in our trying to digest the story to figure out the meaning or to figure out the ending. My heart begins to race. I would say the bears divorced at some point. <laughs> <laughs> you played so beautifully, so beautiful that I'm honored to have been aligned by the universe to listen to you. It's a cliche, I know, but it's rare and beautiful to see such fiery passion and connection from every inch of your body down to your fingers. It's like, a, a, it's like a, an electrical current the through from the inch of your toes to your to the inch of your fingers. Your story is so relatable. Thank you for sharing your history. Thank you for showing that us that greatness and such talent is achievable and it is just behind passion and hard work. Oh wow. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful, Tortora. Thank you. I think you've, oh I think you've touched a nerve. The emotional level in this room. Is, it's, <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a lot. That is just so beautiful and moving. I've never had a poem written, <laughs> written about me or for me. So <laughs> I'm, I'm equally honoured to be in your presence, and I'm really, really grateful that you channeled your feelings and wrote that beautiful words for me. And I feel like crying again now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We're with joy, though, Thank because it's a beautiful, beautiful connection. Thank beautiful. you so much. Thank you. And, of course, over here, you can see Hannah. Why don't you Hannah, turn your picture. So Hannah has painted a picture. Why don't you show Hannah? Um, can you show me that? Yes. Nice. Go to oh, nice. <laughs> wow, look at that. I love that. Wow, that's so cool. <laughs> You've inspired a lot of creative work with wow. your creative work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you to us all. Um, wow. I, I, I wasn't expecting to get as choked up as I oh. have been. Or you, this is how you roll, isn't it? Sponsored this is, by Kleenex. This is what it's all about. For you. <laughs> You're not playing. Um, well, you do play, but you're not playing. Um, well, all I, all I <laughs> So it just remains really for us to just thank you so much for coming and talking to us and sharing and coming back to SOAS. And I hope you come back many times more because we love you. I and love SOAS too. Thank and you. thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Nikki. Yeah.